Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble estate of the servant. And behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is, is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the imaginations. They say that, uh, and it's true, they say that every Sunday is a little Easter. That every Sunday is set apart from all the other days. Which is funny because everyone knows, how, well, I should, I should say everyone knows, but it's just everyone has heard that there are 40 days in Lent. But I bet you've never been told that they're not consecutive. Every Sunday in Lent is not part of Lent. It's Easter. It's a little Easter. And so well, every time we meet, Every single Sunday, not even only in Lent, but every single Sunday, we come to Easter to hear about Christ, Him crucified, died, buried, ri risen again, uh, ordaining His pastors, and then ascending into heaven. And that we look and wait for the coming of Christ once again to judge both the living and the dead. Now that's true. It's true that, that we come to hear Easter. We come to hear the good news of the gospel. But what some may not know is that every Sunday is also a little Christmas. And we sing it and we say it every Sunday. But we don't listen to what we sing. We don't listen to what we say in the liturgy. We don't confess with a full heart. The little ones who come to a Wednesday service and we study the divine service setting three, what we're truly doing is that we're, we are studying the Word of God. Because that's what the liturgy is. The Word of God. And so, when we take the liturgy, and you can ask any of the little ones where the service begins, they'll say it begins with the intro it. And that's true. For us, it's the psalm, uh, which we chanted. And then to the Gloria. And then we go to the very reason why Christ came to earth to begin with. From the fall onward, Hosanna was the loud cry of the people of Israel. We need a God to save us because they realized that they could not save themselves. And if anything were to prove that they could not save themselves, 40 years in the wilderness will do it to you. Where God would give them provisions and everything that they needed, and yet they would say, Whoa, we loathe this, this food that you give unto us. Again, I'm going to point out the fact that the food was just magically, not magically, but it was just automatically there every morning when they woke up. There was bread on the ground for them. And yet, complained they did. We want meat. We want meat. We also want salvation. Give us salvation. Hosanna. That is translated, save us now. It's emphatic. We're telling God that we want to be saved now. We're holding God to His promises. You promised to save us. Save us. And then we remember who we are. And we remember that we, are, we call upon God in times of need. And as you know, after 9-11 and after tragedies, shootings, whatever you, you, whatever may happen, uh, uh, weather disasters, the, the churches fl flood and they're full. And I love seeing Augustana full, especially without a tragedy. But to come and hear 
and, 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 hear and speak the words of God. That's a treasure that not many people have. Not, many, not everyone has the liturgy. So you have to ask yourselves, do you listen to yourself when you sing and say the liturgy? Or do you just go through the motions? Because let me show you something marvelous and magnificent in our liturgy. The Kyrie Eleison. That is, Lord, have mercy. So from this time up, for this time in the service, we have confessed our sins, been forgiven, uh, and also have entered into the sink, into the chancel. We have prayed, we have heard the word, we, we, have, we have prayed and heard the word. Before that, we come to this part. And notice three times it says, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. God the Father, have mercy upon us. God the Son, have mercy upon us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. For we do not deserve, we do not deserve your forgiveness. We deserve nothing in this life but hell. That's what, that's what we deserve. And if you're honest with yourselves, you know that you've felt that way before. I don't know, I don't know anyone who has ever thought, no, how could anyone ever love me? Someone has thought, we have thought that at some point in our lives. And when we, when we get married, we think, how did, we, how did I get so lucky? I did not think that anyone would love me because I can't really love myself. I have a hard time getting out of bed even. I'm such a mess, I had to get married or die. Well, maybe you didn't say that, but I did. And so we understand the human estate when we come to the Lord and ask for mercy. And so we join the voices of the Israelites in the desert. Lord have mercy, God the Father have mercy, Christ have mercy, God the, the Holy Spirit have mercy. And here's the beautiful thing about the liturgy. I want you to make sure that you look at this. When we, in the liturgy, when we're asking for the forgiveness of sins, we're asking for mercy, the very next section, He gives it to us. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, glory be to God on high. And the next thing that you sing is the birth of Jesus. Look at it. Glory be to God on high, and peace and, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. As soon as we ask for the forgiveness of sins, our liturgy points us to the incarnation of Christ. And what would be done? And then notice again, we praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord God, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. All of that is regarding the incarnation of Christ. And then, once again, as you'll hear uh, Patty play it, it drops down uh, an octave. Or drops down to a, to a baritone when we start to sing. Uh, o Lord, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that taketh away the sin of the world. That's where it drops down. That, that taketh away the sin of the world. And we pray again, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, please receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, Almighty God the Father, have mercy upon us. So once again, we, we repent three times, three more times in the liturgy. Three more times. And how does God answer? We tell Him that we believe and have hope in Him, for Thou only art holy. 
Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And it's right there at, for, for thou only art holy, is the volume or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tune comes up and we believe that we have been forgiven after being repentant. Now, why is it that we're brought, when we, when, we, when we repent, our liturgy brings us to the birth of Christ? Why is it? And it's because everything is answered in our prayers. It's all begun when the womb of Mary is open and Christ steps forth the Lord of all, as St. Ambrose says. Mary says that her soul magnifies the Lord and that God has become man and that that man would enter into the world and actually take on human flesh. Actually take on human flesh. You know how humiliating that is for God? That He would take on our flesh? And, and the one greatest reason that He would take on flesh is because flesh is the thing that can be nailed to a cross. He had to become man so that He could be nailed to a piece of wood. And He dies. And who is there looking at, his, at her son while she does it? St. Mary. The one whose heart would be pierced also. I know that none of you can imagine watching your son being crucified. And then we have to ask the question and never sing the song. And, but we do have to wonder if she knew, if Mary knew. And the answer is yes. Yes, she knew. But knowing and watching your son being crucified are two different things. And so as she watched, she gathered, uh, she, she gathered in her mind all that had happened as she followed her son. And there she sees him hanging. And Christ looks down and even though he's the one being crucified, has mercy on her and says, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. That there is a liturgy as well. The liturgy of mercy. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And it's ended with, it is finished. The liturgy of the crucifixion in which Mary plays a part by being the receiver of the mercy of Christ. And so then, we must ask if that is true for Mary, being that she was chosen especially for, by God to be, a, to be a blessing, that she would be called the most favored of all women. If it's true for her, is that true for us? Because she, of course, was chosen by God. How are we ever to attain such a level? And that's just it. He chose St. Mary to be the mother of God. He chose you to be the children of whom Mary gave birth. So He has chosen you. He has chosen you for a purpose. And that purpose is not the way that other preachers preach it. I'll just say it. Joel Osteen. The way that he preaches it. You don't, your purpose in this life is to live for your neighbor and to die in Christ. Once you've been washed in the waters of holy baptism, 
you join with the saints numbered in heaven and on earth. And all there is left is to live. Uh, and I don't want to mean to. I don't want to sound like a Hobby Lobby uh, clearance section. But all that is left is to live, to love your neighbor, and then to die in the arms of Jesus. And in that sense, that makes us all saints. We thank God for St. Mary. Not because she in any way, shape, or form saves us, but we love her as our own mother because she loved the Lord, our God, as only a mother can love. And so we give thanks to her for that. We give thanks to the Lord for forgiving her of all of her sins and for forgiving us of all of our sins. As we continue through the liturgy, listen. Listen to what you sing and to what you say as we continue. When it comes to the lifting up of the host or the Eucharist, if you've ever wondered why, I hold it up to say Christ is here. And the chalice, Christ is here. And so we kneel behind the altar because it is a sign that we believe that Christ is truly present. And then, get this, that this is the best, this is the, one of the coolest things in all the liturgy. I hold the chalice and the Eucharist up like this and you confess your faith. You confess what it is. And I hope that you sing it as loudly and as beautifully as you can because it's a confession of what it is. O Lamb of God that takest away the sin of the world. The Agnus Dei. You get to say those words. You don't have to say them. You get to say them. Behold the Lamb of God right there in the hands of Pastor. Oh, that I would eat and drink of it. Eat and drink of it fully for the forgiveness of my, of my sins. When we confess the Agnus Day, we should also hunger and thirst for what the Lamb provides. Flesh given for you. Blood shed for you. And in that sense, we worship God, the angels and archangels, and all the company of heaven with St. Mary, St. Martha, Saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of those in whom Christ has forgiven. And so it is a good thing that we celebrate our own forgiveness because in, in, in the darkness of repentance, the light of forgiveness shines ever more brightly. Thanks be to God. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. And you know what? Jesus says, yes, I will. Come and eat. Come and drink with me. And I will give you the rest that you need. Come to, come to Augustana. Come to church. Eat, drink, I will give you rest. The same rest that I gave my mother when she died. The same rest that I gave all of those there when they died. Yes, my dear sons and daughters, I give you mercy and I give you rest. Come and eat of that peace. Amen.